Welcome back, everybody. We're going to start again, so if you're milling about, come on in, please. Our next speaker of the day, he graduated with honors from Rutgers College, was a master's candidate at Cornell University, and was a PhD candidate at the University of California, Berkeley, where he was the recipient of a National Science Foundation PhD fellowship. He previously was a professor for six years at the, at the New School for Social uh, Research and at the S City University of New York. He's currently the director of the Consciousness and Contact Research Institute, or CCRI, an academic research institute comprised of more than 25 PhD academics, medical doctors, and researchers whose mission is to explore a new paradigm that seeks to integrate the findings of consciousness research and the phenomenology of extraordinary experiences with the contact modalities, a term that he coined in 2013. Randa's academics argue that all of the contact modalities, all the different ways that humans are piercing the veil of our reality and communicating with conscious intelligence via NDEs, OBEs, astral travel, UFOs, ghosts, spirits, remote viewing, um, hallucinogenic journeys, etc., might be interrelated and might be one phenomenon involving a manipulation of space-time and, by definition, might be interdimensional in nature. <clears throat> Why? Because of all of the CCRI academics and CCRI hypothesize that consciousness is primary. Ray has also published in several peer uh, review academic journals, including the Journal of Consciousness Studies and the Journal of the Society for Scientific Exploration. Ray's new project is a 2,000-page, four-volume book, Oh My God, Ray, <laughs> and a full-featured science uh, documentary entitled A Greater Reality, The New Paradigm of Non-Local Consciousness, the Paranormal, and the Contact Modalities. A Greater Reality will be published on May 1st, 2022. So. Please join me in welcoming Ray Hernandez. Thank you. Okay. Before 2013, I would have thought that everyone here was crazy. 2012, March 4th, 2012 to be exact. So let me tell you a little bit about where I started and uh, my journey, and more importantly, the academic research uh, that I've been involved with since, uh, since 2013. So the name of our current organization is Consciousness and Contact Research Institute, and um, it's got a whole boatload of PhDs, medical doctors, and researchers, like the two gentlemen that you saw before, uh, people that are not academics, but they've been working uh, to research all aspects of the paranormal, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, UFOs, etc., for many, many, many years. Also, um, I'm giving away 10 chapters from my two books for free, okay? Just send me an email at info at a greater reality. Right there at the bottom, you'll see it there. All right. The title of my presentation is Towards a Unified Theory of Consciousness and the Contact Modalities. Um, as you can see, I'm an overeducated individual. I went to all these fancy schools, and I pretty much had straight A's for, for the last eight years, except as a freshman in college, and that was, you know, party time, okay? But basically, it's straight A's. You'd be the last person to think that I'd be interested in these things. Uh, in terms of work, I'm, uh, I'm an attorney with the Department of Treasury. I was a manager for the New York City Metropolitan Transit Authority. And previous to that, I was a, a professor for seven years at both the City University of New York and the New School for Social Research. 
Uh, previous to March of 2012, I had zero interest in UAPs, uh, otherwise known as UFOs, uh, the paranormal and non-human intelligence. As I said earlier, I would have thought that each and every one of you were crazy. <laughs> On March 3rd, 2012, our 15-year-old dog named Nena, and you, you could see her there in the picture, she's a Jack Russell Terrier, uh, she was like our first child. Um, she had severe arthritis, a bad heart. Uh, she walked like an old lady on crutches. Uh, that uh, evening at 8 p.m., uh, she became totally paralyzed. I called my vet, Dr. Phil Cruz, and he agreed to open up his office Sunday in the afternoon to euthanize her. So the next day was going to be her last day on planet Earth, at least so I thought. And uh, my wife, who's from Mexico, uh, a devout Catholic, uh, she began to pray all night to the Virgin Mary of Mexico, the Virgin of Guadalupe, for a miracle. And me, being the good atheist that I was, I said, you can do all the praying you want, nothing's going to happen, I'm going to sleep. So all night she stayed up praying. The next morning at 6 o'clock, uh, the dog was barking, we checked her out, she was still totally paralyzed. My wife carried her down the stairs to see if she could go to the bathroom, and this is what she saw in our living room. So she thought it was an angel that had answered her prayers, and she began to pray. She knelt down and started praying. And then um, she started yelling at me, Ray, Ray, Ray. And me being a good uh, skeptic, Sunday morning, 6 o'clock, I said, what the hell, man? You know, waking me up at 6 o'clock. So I ignored her. She then went upstairs, hauled me out of bed, and said, I need to come, you know, see what, what's in the living room. So when we both walked down the stairs, she got to the, the wooden floor of our living room, and she and our dog disappeared, vanished. Okay? And then what I saw was not what she saw. I saw something totally different. I now describe it as an energy being. And the person that did that graphic de uh, depiction is very, very close of what I saw. It was pure energy fluctuating with multiple colors floating four feet off the ground. It was roughly um, three feet wide by about a foot in height. And then this intelligence totally controlled my consciousness. I didn't care that my wife had disappeared, the dog had disappeared. You know, I waved my hand at it and I said, ah, bullshit. This is what you got me up for, for this crap, you know? I'm going back to sleep. So I walked straight up the stairs, put my hands on my chest like this, and I was immediately knocked out, okay? Almost an hour later, when I woke up, I was now fully conscious. And I said, what the, you know what? <laughs> and I ran down the stairs, and then I saw my wife, like, re reappeared again. She's looking down, and the dog is running around the entire living room like a puppy, okay? And so that was like an atomic bomb blew up in my brain because at that point, you know, my sense of reality, my conception of reality was completely shattered. So then um, I'll go, I will not go over the details of the discussions with my wife, but it was basically, it was total chaos. To her, these were angels and I was an atheist and I wouldn't understand and then, um, uh, to me, it was paranormal. So the whole time afterwards, I was spending on the computer, paranormal this, paranormal that, you know? And I couldn't find anything that matched what happened to us. So then two months later, the dog woke us up, at, woke my wife up at 3.30 in the morning, and she said, okay, maybe she wants to go to the bathroom. So she went downstairs, and uh, she went outside. She heard a very large noise outside. She said it was like a 747 jet was right above her. She looked up. And that's what she saw, okay? She then said, oh, my angels came and visited me last night. They came in a beautiful angelic craft. It had stained glass windows just like our church, you know? <laughs> so I asked her to draw it. She drew it. I said, what you saw was a UFO. I said, you wouldn't understand. You're an atheist, you know? <laughs> so that's how our experiences began, and that's why I realized that this was possibly UFO-related. So in August of 2012, six months after the initial experience, my wife by then had called down countless of UFOs, and it was these large objects would appear, 
Um, most of the time, they were not physical, okay, like a, you would think of a regular flying saucer. Um, so I said, what the hell, let me give it a try. Within 15 minutes, this is what appeared. This is a graphic depiction of it, okay? Um, in that experience, that object was 30 feet away from myself, my daughter, and eventually three adult friends that came uh, during that experience. It was the size of a full, small football stadium. This graphic drawing does not depict what it actually looked like. There was telepathic communication and information, images that were downloaded uh, into my consciousness. After I requested that it change its, uh, its appearance, because my friends still thought that it was not a UAP, the original image that I was watching, the one that you saw earlier, totally disappeared. Immediately replaced by stars that were not in the sky. They were inside where that object was, okay? And they all began to flash on and off, on and off, on and off, on and off. And then they would take turns, these, uh, I call them stars, but these orbs that were flashing on and off, and they would get big, like the size of the moon. You know, how the moon gets in certain nights, you know, where it becomes real big, and then it would go down again. And then another star would take its turn doing that. And then my friends stopped trying to explain it away, because they knew this was not uh, man-made. Um, so this intelligence also influenced my thoughts. It uploaded my daughter's previous communications, it reprogrammed them and placed them in my consciousness uh, by me hearing a vo her voice saying, Daddy, next time you see a UFO, you call me, please. Don't forget. So in my mind was, my daughter wants to see you see a UFO. But my, no my daughter never told me this. Okay? Never. So I ran out to the window. I'm yelling at her, come outside. There's a UFO. And she opens up the window, and she's there like in 20 seconds outside. And then... Um, so, uh, as I said before, I realized at that point that it was a, a computer upload of my daughter's voice. Uh, not, not at that time, later on, that it reformatted her information, her voice patterns, and then downloaded the information back to me. So, it was a computer upload, reprogramming of her voice patterns, and then downloading it back to me. Why? Because she had never told me that. This 45-minute experience with this UAP that was 30 feet away from me and my daughter and these um, three adult friends uh, led to the beginning of almost four years of paranormal, psychic experiences, out-of-body experiences, synchronicities, physics downloads, sightings of various forms of non-human intelligence, and other UAP sightings. Um, and three and near-death experience type of experiences all within a four-year period. Um, now, the beginning of my academic research into this arena began with an out-of-body experience while I was driving my car in the middle of a traffic jam at 8.30 in the morning, right next to Miami Airport. <laughs> um, so I was in the middle of a traffic jam listening to this man doing uh, an interview on a documentary that he was doing on his liposuction, okay? So all of a sudden, I'm not in the car anymore. I'm just mind, okay? Um, and then oh, little by little, I, I see that I'm inside this huge, gigantic wheel. And I'm in the fulcrum, in the middle of this wheel. And all of a sudden, I start receiving telepathic messages and visual projections. What I was shown. I was shown via these downloads of information inside that huge, gigantic wheel via these video projections that inside each of the different spokes was what I now call a contact modality. In one spoke was near-death experiences. Another spoke was out-of-body experiences. Another spoke was UFOs. Another spoke was hallucinogenic journeys. Another spoke was channeling. Another spoke was people that see dead people, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And um, what I was told was that all of these, what I now call contact modalities, are actually one phenomenon instead of separate and distinct phenomenon. I was told that what humans call consciousness is actually the very fabric of our reality. See, they, they, they played it simple with me. They didn't give me any advanced stuff. <laughs> and they said that the glue that's holding the contact modalities together 
is actually consciousness. And then they gave me instructions of what I needed to do, very specific instructions. So within 50 hours, I was led to three individuals who eventually became the four co-founders of the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation. The first one was Mary Rodwell. The very next day at 9.30 in the morning, I received a phone call from Dr. Rudy Shields, an emeritus professor of astrophysics from Harvard. And then the very next day at 10 a.m., I was at the home of Dr. Edgar Mitchell. So if some of you are skeptical and don't believe me, if Mary Rodwell ever lectures in any of these conferences that you're at, ask Mary. Ray, Ray told us this crazy story. Is it true? And she'll tell you. Rudy Shields from Harvard. I could give you his email. You could send him an email. And he'll corroborate everything that I've told you. So within 50 hours, the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation was in the process of being established. So the contact modalities. The contact modalities are all of the different ways that humans are piercing the veil of our physical reality uh, via what Dr. Edgar Mitchell called non-local consciousness and having diverse contact experiences with various forms of non-human intelligence. In 2013, I coined the term contact modalities so I could try to give a name to what I experienced. And I published a paper uh, in the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation website, which no longer exists. We uh, replaced it with a new organization, and we're building a new website for that. I'll show you that later. And so in 2013, uh, Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Rhys Shield, who, as I said before, was a professor of astrophysics at Harvard, they approved the paper. They made some changes to it. And the title of that paper was The Quantum Hologram Theory of Consciousness and the Contact Modalities. So what are the contact modalities? The contact modalities are UAP contact experiences, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, uh, communication with ghosts and spirits, astral travel, remote viewing, um, uh, hallucinogenic journeys. Uh, if you take DMT or psilocybin, magic mushrooms, and all of a sudden this being appears right in front of you and says, Mary, you're screwing up, man, you're screwing up. You need to change your life, you know through these, hallu these hallucinogenic journeys, so, and mediumship, channeling, and many other types of human communication with non-human intelligence, and it's related paranormal experiences. The, the members in our group, and you, hear, you will hear Dr. John Alexander tomorrow uh, say the very similar concepts that, that I'm presenting today. So uh, the other three co-founders, as I said before, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, six man to walk on the moon, the founder of the Institute for Noetic Sciences and the co-founder of FREE, Dr. Rudy Shields, Emeritus Professor of Astrophysics at Harvard University, and Mary Rodwell. Uh, she's been researching UFO contact experiencers for over 30 years. How can we compare the UFO-related contact experiencers to NDE experiencers, to out-of-body experiencers, and other experiencers of the contact modalities when there was no comprehensive worldwide statistical data on UAP contact experiencers. Uh, thus, there was a need for a formal, comprehensive, multinational, multi-language academic research study on UAP contact experiencers. All you had were thousands of books written by people that had contact experiences, UFO-related contact experiences, or books that were based off hypnotic regressions. And there are numerous problems associated with hypnotic regressions, which I won't go into. I use the term UAP instead of UFO because the research findings from thousands of respondents to the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Experiential Research Study revealed thousands of different types of UAPs. Uh, the last thing that people are seeing are an actual flying saucer, <laughs> okay? So it's, um, uh, that's a more appropriate term because UFOs are usually associated with flying saucers from the first time it was used. Okay, the four co-founders of the Free Foundation, uh, together with the assistance of more than 10 PhD academics and eight lay researchers, um, for example, uh, Kathleen Martin, many of you have probably heard her name. She was one of these eight individuals. Dr. Leo Sprinkle, Barbara Lamb, who's going to be speaking as well virtually. Um, these are just some of the people that were uh, part of this uh, research organization. And we developed this research study. 
It was a five-year academic research study. So it was, as I said before, the world's first comprehensive academic statistical research study. It took five years from the very beginning when we developed the questions for the surveys to by the date that we published our book. Our book is 820 pages, weighs three and a half pounds. Uh, you could buy two of them and do, you know, dumbbell exercises, you know, uh, while you're watching TV, okay? So um, it has 15 chapters. And most of our researchers in our organization wrote a chapter for our book. Uh, as I said before, Dr. John Alexander is going to be speaking tomorrow, wrote a chapter for our book as well. And Edgar Mitchell as well. Okay. The following data presentation is based solely from our English language survey. We did it in multiple languages. To qualify to take our surveys, you needed to have had the following. One is you needed to see a UFO. Number two, you needed to have some type of contact experience with a non-human intelligence. The three co-editors of our book was myself, Dr. Rudy Shields, and Dr. John Klimo, who was a professor for over 45 years in psychology. And for 45 years, he wrote tons of books and articles, many of them academic articles, about the paranormal and consciousness. So the data from our research study. The data from our research study contradicts much of the misinformation and disinformation that is circulating in materialist ufology. Why? Because the basic statistical data was never collected. And I'll go into some of that data right now. <laughs> surveys. We developed three surveys. The first two surveys were quantitative in nature. We asked 660 quantitative questions. Survey three was open-ended questions. We asked 70 open-ended questions. For three years, we publicized it all over the place. I won't go into all those details, but you could read it up there. YouTube, uh, Facebook, over 200 radio shows. Uh, uh, um, some of you might know Rosemary Ellen Guiley. She was a leading uh, paranormal expert. She was also part of a group. Rosemary had her own show. Uh, Kathleen Martin, every week she appeared on a radio show. So we were introducing these, uh, the, these surveys uh, all over the place. Also, uh, we only allowed conscious explicit memory and not memories via hypnotic regressions, lucid dreams, or channeling. Later on, I could answer that question of why we only why we excluded those. The survey languages were English, Spanish, French, German, Slovak, and very soon in Chinese. For the Spanish survey, we had 1,200 people that took our surveys. For the English language survey, we had 4,350 people from over 125 countries that completed phase one of our survey. For the phase three, which is the open-ended questions, we had more, uh, almost 1,500 people to answer these open-ended questions. We received more than 10,000 pages of writings from individuals. And poor John Klimo had the task of reviewing phase three and writing a chapter for our book. Uh, it was 200 pages in length, <laughs> just to let you know. Okay, eight important findings, okay? And I'll go through each of them in detail. But this is just an overview. Number one, these experiences were overwhelming positive experiences. Number two, there was a positive transformation of the contact experiencer. These people completely changed for the positive. Number three, these experiences were primarily paranormal and not physical experiences. While you might have seen UFOs, you might have seen a physical being, the overwhelming majority of your experiences can be categorized as paranormal. Number four, there was a manipulation of space-time, which leads to the hypothesis that these experiences might be interdimensional. And I'll go in, over in detail that category. Also, all of the contact modalities, they all involve a manipulation of space-time. Out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, you see in ghosts and spirits, you know, all involve manipulation of space-time. Number five, one third of the experiences, experiencers had an abduction, okay? And that uh, was defined as a forced relocation to another location. Two thirds did not. But yet, the whole field of ufology sees the whole contact phenomenon as merely an abduction. 
So what they did is they ignored two-thirds of the people. This is not just about abductions. But even then, the topic of abductions is a misnomer because 92% of people that stated that they had abduction, now they call themselves contactees. They don't call themselves abductees for many reasons, okay? And I'll go into those details later on. For the abductions, initially 37% viewed their experiences as negative. This is in the very beginning. Over time, they continued to have multiple experiences. The experiences changed, became much more positive. In the beginning, you might have been visited by three little grays. You know, you were paralyzed. 25 years later, when you're taking our survey, you're being visited by these human-looking beings dressed in white monk's robes. They're taking you to other realities, and they're giving you spiritual lessons. Okay? So that's just an example. So by the end, when people were taking our surveys, only 4% viewed their experiences as negative. Finding number six, 50% of these people were brought to a matrix reality. These experiences were overwhelmingly positive. Spiritual lessons in this matrix reality were, were taught. Time seemed to stop. And they were shown visions of their past, present, and future, but also humanity's past, present, and future. Finding number seven, 50% reported a UFO-related medical healing, just like our dog, except these were individuals. Um, one of the individuals was Kathleen Martin. At that time, she didn't go public with it. She was listed in chapter six in our book uh, in, on medical healings, but at that time, she didn't want her name disclosed, but now she's gone public of it. Uh, as I said, you send me an email, I'll send you numerous chapters. One of those chapters is chapter six on miraculous medical healings. 85%, finding number eight, 85% understand that there is a relationship between UFO contact, the paranormal, and the spirit world. Now, let's go into the first topic. Was your contact experience positive, negative, or neutral? We asked over 40 different questions because depending how you phrase the question, you'll get a different response. So the following is just an example of some of the questions that we asked. As I said, we had 40 questions. So how would you describe your experiences? Was it positive, negative, or neutral? Very straightforward. Nothing misleading in there, right? Well, guess what? 66% said it was positive. Neutral, 29%. Negative was 5%. ET, we defined it also as non-human intelligence. Because um, the verbiage that people have been commonly using is ET or alien, okay? But our preferred preference was, uh, was non-human intelligence. Because a lot of people were interacting with energy beings, with human-looking beings, etc. So um, when you see the word ET, think of also of non-human intelligence. So the question is, if you could stop your ET, non-human intelligence, contact experiences, would you? Well, guess what? 84% said, no, don't stop it. Keep it coming, baby. Keep it coming. That's not what you read in these UFO conferences I listened to from some of these speakers and some of these individuals. This is 4,300 people that are telling you this. Do you believe the ETs are bad, malevolent, or evil? 91% said no. Now, we even asked for the different types of beings. Uh, the largest category was actually, you didn't show up in that list. <laughs> so people were saying, seeing every type of being you could imagine. There was even one lady that had an experience of like a, a booger, a mucus, except it was huge, and it was attached to the corner of her living room, okay? So people have seen everything, okay? So here are, you could see, um, the energy being was number one. Number two was the human-looking being. The short grays was, was the next category, number three. The ghost or the spirit form was number four, and then it went down the list. Now, in terms of how the people that perceived it as negative, okay, for the energy being was 7%, human looking being 5%, the short grays 11%. That's not what you read on the internet, right? Every time you, you open up the internet and you type on, you know, an abduction or a UFO contact, whatever, you always see this horrible looking you know, little gray being, you know, staring at you, you know. And so immediately you say, okay, this thing is going to eat me up. It's going to rape my wife or, you know, kill my daughter. But look, 11% viewed it as negative. 
Even the evil dreaded reptilian, okay? 23% viewed it as negative. But when we looked at their written responses, that people had reptilian experiences, they never mentioned that anything negative that happened. What, what happened was that these people were frightened to death. All of a sudden, you see this eight-foot being right in front of you, you know, like a, in a crocodile body, okay, with little uh, uh, eyes like a cat, you know, s slit eyes, staring a couple of feet from you, you know, you're going to uh, pass out. So anyway, this is thousands of people, as you can see. Even the reptilian, look at that, 644 people had reptilian experiences. This is not one, two, or three, or four, or five people. No, this is 644 people. Huge numbers. Finding number two, contact resulted in a positive transformation of the experiencer. We borrowed 70 questions from Dr. Kenneth Ring's book titled The Omega Project, Near-Death Experiences, UFO Encounters, and the Mind at Large. That research study was done, um, if I recall, 1986. Dr. Kenneth Ring was a professor of psychology at the University of Connecticut, and he was one of the early leading pioneers uh, of near-death experience research. And so what he did is he compared 85 people that had a near-death experience with 85 people that had a UFO abduction. And so uh, he asked numerous questions, but 70 of these questions dealt with how did they change? How were you before your experience? How are you now? Okay? And what he found was, depending on the question that was asked, between 75 to 95 percent of these people totally changed to the positive. Now let's go into some of these questions. One question was, how did UFO contact change your life? 51 percent said it was highly positive change. 22 percent said it was slightly positive. 17 percent was it had a neutral effect. Slightly negative, 6%. Highly negative was 4%. So again, you're hearing it straight from the horse's mouth. This is a, a, a positive influence in their lives. As you can see in yellow, yellow is what increased. So the question is, since my first UFO contact experience, so what increased was my desire to help others, my compassion for others, my appreciation of the ordinary things of life, my sensitivity to the suffering of others, my concern with spiritual matters, my desire to achieve a higher consciousness, my appreciation of nature, my spiritual feelings, my concern with the welfare of planet Earth, my understanding of what life is all about, my personal sense of purpose in life, my concern with ecological matters. Okay, Isn't this the type of person that you will want to be married to, <laughs> someone that you will want your children to grow up to be like, okay? These are how people change after having a UFO contact experience, a positive transformation. Now let's look at the opposite, what decreased. What decreased was my concern for material things. All of a sudden it's like, I don't need the new Mercedes Benz every year, let me deal with the old Honda Accord. My interest in organized religion, okay? Like my wife, you know, every Sunday I had to go to church. Every Thursday I had to go to a group prayer meeting. If not, there was no you-know-what and no food, you know. So I had to attend, okay. And then now my wife goes to church like once every six months, okay. Uh, my competitive tendencies. All of a sudden you're not going to screw over your partner in the office to, to get the promotion, okay. My fear of death. You hear that over and over again with near-death experiences, Okay. Now you're hearing it from UFO contact experiencers. Look at that. 73% of these individuals, they don't fear death. My desire to become well-known, famous, ego, ego. No, ego goes down. Okay? So, did anyone know about that? Was this ever categorized statistically? Here it is from thousands of people. Now let me give you actual examples. Okay? Kathleen Martin started off with her very famous book now, Captured, The Alien Abduction of Benny and Barney Hill. And now look at her latest book, A Personal Journey from Alien Abduction to Spiritual Transformation. Okay, again, the transformation, spiritual transformation. Whitley Strieber, he started off with his book, Communion, The Most Horrible Abduction You Could Ever Experience, Anal probes, you know. Now he's writing about 
the afterlife communication that he has with his dead wife. He says he prays every night to his visitors and to God for allowing him to obtain spirituality and allowing him to communicate with his wife. So you see that he's just another example. But yet you won't hear this in ufology. Whitley Strieber, from fear to spirituality. And I was thinking, Annie, if you exist at all in any way, I must, you, must, you must let me know somehow. The phone rang. Then I remembered that we had talked about back in the 90s when Anne had realized that the whole close encounter experience and the reappearance of the dead friends and relatives in people's lives were connected. They are real, the dead. She, she said, one of the things she said was, and I think it's quite true, is I'm not Anne anymore, but I will always be Anne for you. You know, you have to understand God as a desperate presence in your life. Otherwise, you, you can't really live as a human, fully as a human being. You have to understand that there is desperate love all the time in your life. Someone is desperately in love with you, and that's God. And it's present everywhere in all of us, and not just in the human being, but in everything. But yet, in ufology conferences, people always refer back to communion and alien abduction, Whitley Strieber and alien abductions, okay? Instead of focusing on Whitley Strieber, who he is now, and how he changed over time, how he got to this point. And again, the field of ufology rarely discusses this. The third major finding, the UAP contact experiencers have had primarily paranormal and not physical contact experiences with non-human intelligence, either before or after the sighting of UAP. In my case, I've called down four very large UAPs. After that, I stopped. I don't have a need for that, okay? But these are large objects like the one that I showed you before. I've only seen a quote-unquote physical being once, the one in my living room, okay? So, but yet, I had four years of paranormal experiences, out-of-body experiences, being brought to other realities, synchronicities, downloads, physics downloads, and all that stuff. Um, so... Let me give you a couple of examples of this major finding. As you can see all the way on the right, you'll see yes highlighted in blue, and no is not highlighted. So, yes. Have you ever had an out-of-body experience? 80%. Have you ever had a near-death experience? 37%. Have you ever had a medical healing by UFO intelligence? 50%. Telepathic communications? 78%. Were you ever brought to a matrix reality? 50%. Have you ever had a past life memory? For example, a memory of your consciousness in a previous life? 66%. Have you seen what can be described as a ghost or a spirit? 76%. Huge numbers. Do you have memories of ever visiting or receiving a glimpse of heaven? I.e. the spirit world? 46%. Have you seen small colored orbs? 67%. Have objects mysteriously appeared right in front of you? That's called an A-port. 25%. Have objects ever fallen or suddenly moved around you and you have no reasonable explanation for it? 61%. Can you see or feel energy or auras around people? 74%. The communication that you receive from non-human intelligence, okay, was the communication in your native language. 75%. You think they're going to appear to someone from Latin America and talk French? Someone from France and speak Greek? No. You, it's just like near-death experiences. Someone has a near-death experience. The communication is going to be in your native language. Okay? This is not a coincidence. Did they impart reassuring messages to you? 61%. Did they provide you with a spiritual message? 54%. Did it give you a message of love or oneness? 54%. Did it express to you concern about humanity's behavior? Usually ecological. 45%. You're destroying your planet. You need to change. Look at all these nuclear weapons. All of a sudden, one of them can go off in Ukraine, and that's it. That's the end of humanity. 
Information about advanced technology, physics, 42%. Environmental messages regarding Earth, 39%. Uh, messages about a future catastrophe and depopulation of humanity, 32%. Messages about God or a creator, 31%. Messages about parallel universes, 31%. I could go on and on and on. Abductions versus no abductions. We ask this question, have you ever had ET contact but have no conscious recollection of ever being abducted? which is defined as taking against your will. Well, guess what? 68% have seen a UFO. They have seen ET, but they never had an abduction. Again, you'll never read that anywhere else because no one bothered to ask these questions statistically. We asked this question just for the abductees. So if you've ever had an abduction, you can take this question, okay? So we, we asked that question how would you characterize your first few and your last few contact experiences with non-human intelligence? So the category that's not highlighted is the first, when it first started, your experiences. So the, all the way on the, on the right-hand side is your last few experiences. What have been your experiences now? So we ask people to choose one of five categories. These are fixed choice answers. So you had to pick one of the five if you wanted to continue with the survey. Now look at this. 35% said they call themselves conscious contactees. They were an egalitarian, equal relationship. 35.2% said it was not an abduction, but I'm a contactee, where you're being treated with respect and understanding. 8.7% said it was an abduction, but they sought my permission. I agreed to it. They treated me with humane and compassionate treatment. So look at that. That's 80% of the people. Okay? 80% of the people view themselves as, as contactees now. Now let's look at the other categories. It was an abduction, but it was a milder kind. It was a slightly more caring kind. 13%. Now the last category, it was an abduction of the most negative kind. 8%. That's what you hear in all these UFO conferences, in all these radio shows, you hear that 8%. But now here I'm demonstrating to you with 4,300 people, okay, the people that had abductions, they're saying something very differently. Whitley Strieber had an abduction. Kathleen Martin had an abduction. Countless of other peoples, you know, that had abductions, but they don't see themselves as abductees. They are contactees. Brought to a matrix reality, involving a manipulation of space-time. As I said, that's what happened to me. 50% of the people that took our surveys have had contact with non-human intelligence in an out-of-body matrix type of reality experience. An experience uh, that, um, with no boundaries and perceived to be in a multi-dimensional reality questions regarding that experience being brought to this other dimension, this other reality. Was your consciousness separate from your body? 67% said yes. Were your senses more vivid than usual? 76%. Did your thoughts speed up? 57% said yes. Did you encounter a mystical being? 79%. Did the reality seem very real to you? 84%. Did you have a feeling of peace and pleasantness? We're surrounded by a brilliant light. The time did not exist, 71%. Did you see a deceased person, 37%. Those are mainly the people who had the near-death experience. Did scenes from the past come to you, 27%. So let me skip over some of these here because you get the idea. <laughs> okay, 50% reported a miraculous medical healing. As I said before, that happened to my dog. Kathleen Martin was another case example. If you send me an email, I'll send you chapter six for our book that had 10 case studies that were uh, Dr. Joseph Burks, who's a retired medical doctor, reviewed the medical charts for these individuals of their medical healings. And that chapter was also written by Preston Dennett. So um, Preston Dennett used many of the case studies from our research study, and he wrote this book titled... The Healing Power of UFOs, 
300 true accounts of people healed by extraterrestrials. 300 cases of UFO-related medical healings. Spirituality in the spirit world. 97% believe that they could travel to other dimensions. 91% believe that there's a grand plan in motion that experiences are all part of. 89% believe that there is a connection between non-human intelligence and the paranormal. 83% that there is a, believe that there's a connection between non-human intelligence and the spirit world. Now, this is what messages they were given, not belief. 31 were given a message about God. 30% were told about the death process, about the spirit world. 28% were told where they were from. 26% were given a message about reincarnation. Okay, why did we start our research study with the UFO contact experiencers? Okay, we did that because almost all of the members of our organization and also our current organization uh, believe that by analyzing, by reviewing the experiencers of the contact modalities and their stories, that that holds the key to be able to understand what is consciousness, what is the nature of our reality. Because, um, as I said before, all of these contact modalities involves a manipulation of space-time. So if you're able to understand their experiences, like for example, a, a near-death experience, you're able to then understand the nature of our reality via a near-death experience. Also via uh, an out-of-body experiences, via UFO contact experiencer. People see ghosts and spirits, you know, that gives you information about what is our reality, okay? Uh, but unlike the others, like, for example, near-death experiences, there are literally thousands of peer-reviewed academic research publications on near-death experiences. You have literally hundreds of books that were written by medical doctors on near-death experiences. Uh, Dr. Uh, Alexander Tomorrow, he, he, he wrote his PhD on the afterlife, okay? So there's been tons of academic work on the afterlife and NDEs, but... UFO contact experiencer, no statistical data before our research study. Now, let's get into this topic of consciousness now, okay? Um, let's discuss also the theories of the UFO phenomenon. What the hell is it, okay? So, towards the end of his life, the father of ufology, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, began developing a hypothesis that the UFO intelligence... Uh, might not be a physical being coming from a physical planet, but instead that it might be an interdimensional phenomenon based on consciousness. Now here you could listen to it from the horse's mouth. The feeling about the UFO phenomenon is that when all is said and done, it represents some form of intelligence. But whether that intelligence is from great distances away, or whether it is perhaps much closer to us in a parallel reality or in another dimension, or whether it is in some strange way a product of our own intelligence, our own psyche, I don't know. This is the, this is the research problem, that, it's in, that it seems to be programmed, that it seems to have an intelligence of its own, I think is unmistakable. If anyone who studies the subject just sees that. But the, we must not jump to the conclusion that because it has an intelligence of its own, it is necessarily visitors from outer space. It may be in some strange way connected with that intelligence if that intelligence can in some way project itself down here. But, uh, well, anyway, that's really all I have to say. That, uh, Okay, to summarize what Dr. Hynek stated, he says, we must not jump to the conclusion that they are visitors from outer space associated with a physical being from a physical planet. He says, it represents an intelligence that might be from a parallel reality or another dimension. He said, or a product of our own psyche. What he meant by that was consciousness. He said, this intelligence may project itself. And that's what I concluded with my own personal experience of that UAP. All of a sudden, I said, you better come up with some better shit than this, man, because my friends don't believe you. All of a sudden, that was wiped out, and a new projection was given to me. These are projections to your consciousness. Okay? So he said, this intelligence may project itself down here to our own physical reality. 
He said, thus Heineck was referring to a consciousness-based phenomenon. Now, Dr. Jacques Vallée, the father of modern ufology, prominently uh, played out by this French guy in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, so, Dr. Heineck's approach was later adopted and expanded by his close friend, Dr. Jacques Vallée, who I consider the father of modern ufology. Dr. Vallée, however, provided generalizations as to its possible consciousness origin, but never provided a proposed ep ep epistemological explanation for the phenomenon. He merely stated, we do not understand space-time. Dr. Vallée also did not associate UFOs as part of one integrated phenomenon associated with all of the other contact modalities. In other words, um, he did not associate UFOs as being one phenomenon together with NDEs, OBEs, people that see dead people, uh, remote viewing, ESP, etc. He understood the paranormal aspects of the phenomenon, but he didn't take it to the step that we're taking it in our organization. Dr. Vallée. I think that uh, from my own point of view, I'm going to be very disappointed if UFOs turn out to be nothing more than visitors from another planet, because I think they could be something much more interesting. Something uh, from another dimension, a space or time? Uh, I think what the UFO phenomenon is teaching us is that um, we don't understand time and space. Mm -hmm. uh, here are objects, I think we have to call them objects, that are physical that interact with the environment, that cause uh, effects on the witnesses, on the psychology and the physiology of the witnesses, and leave traces on the ground, and yet are capable of, appear to be capable of manipulating time and space in ways that go beyond what our physics understands today. So to summarize, Dr. Vallée, I will be disappointed if UFOs turn out to be nothing more than visitors from another planet. I think what the UFO phenomenon is teaching us is that we don't understand time and space. Here are objects that are physical. They interact with humans and yet are capable of manipulating time and space in ways that go beyond what is our understanding of the physics today. So Dr. Vallée clearly is not a materialist. Someone says that these UFOs are clearly physical beings and physical spacecrafts from another planet. He has a totally different hypothesis. And now you have the father of ufology saying the same thing, J. Allen Hynek, and you have the next person who, uh, Dr. Vallée, who I consider the father of modern ufology saying the same thing. But ufology does not accept those things. They're still materialists. Now, uh, my dear friend, Dr. John Alexander, who's going to be speaking tomorrow, and um, I'm very proud to be his friend, and this is what he stated in an interview with Dr. Jeffrey Mishloff. You, you now believe that if we're going to understand the UFO phenomenon, we have to look at it in this wider context, in, right. including interspecies communication, shamanism, higher states of consciousness, and so on. Right. Remote viewing. I did a lot of work with near-death uh, studies. Mm -hmm. I was once the uh, president of the International Association for Near-Death Studies. And it is my premise that somehow all of these phenomena are connected. One of the problems in looking at it is we tend to stovepipe. And I think in doing that, you cut off a lot of the information that would be helpful in understanding a theoretical basis, which mm -hmm. does not exist at this point. By the, the, using the term stovepipe, I think you mean trying to see it as a single discipline rather Correct. than an yeah. interdisciplinary approach. Very, very much so. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you look at near-death experience, poltergeist, remote viewing, UFOs, and they cut off access of the information in between. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a mistake. So I hope I'm not uh, stealing John's thunder for tomorrow. <laughs> but basically, the way... Um, these different fields of people that study UFOs, people that study near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, etc., uh, they put all UFOs in one little box. 
UFOs have nothing to do with near-death experiences. All the people study near-death experiences, what the hell does UFOs have to do with this? What the hell does out-of-body experiences have to do with this? Uh, I made a presentation at, um, at the International uh, Association of uh, Out-of-Body Experiences. I forgot the name. It was like the largest OBE organization. All of them was like, what the hell does UFO have to do with out-of-body experiences? What the hell does out-of-body experiences have to do with near-death experiences? No, 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 no. This is a totally separate phenomenon. So what we're saying is that people are missing how they are linked, how they are interrelated. And as you could see by the data of the UFO contact experiencer, they're having everything in the kitchen sink, okay? They're having all of these experiences. And that's just not with UFO contact experience. That's also near-death experiences. One thing that people don't know about is a very large number of people have had near NDEs. After their NDEs, they begin to see ghosts and spirits, dead people, okay? I'll talk a little bit of that later on. So, Dr. Alexander's summary. Uh, as he said before, he was the president of the International Association of near Death Studies. His PhD was on the afterlife. He said, to understand the UFO phenomenon, we need to look at it via a wider context. Um, and I put in the term contact modalities. Um, he said, and not a separate uh, phenomenon. He says, they are not separate. He says, one of the problems is that we tend to stovepipe each phenomenon as a single discipline instead of viewing it via an interdisciplinary approach. He said, very important, somehow all of these phenomena are connected. Dean Radin, the chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which is the organization that was founded by the late Dr. Edgar Mitchell. I knew that Edgar was very interested in pursuing the, the UFO ET contact idea because he, he had become convinced through his own experience and through his contacts with other people that there was something there, there's something worth studying. So his part of, of his, his genius and his passion was to use the best tools that we have, the tools of science uh, to, to understand the full range of experiences. So in the case of, uh, of, of looking at the larger body of, of a very wide range of experiences, this is where Edgar was very interested, and Free has basically taken up the mantle for that part. So in a sense, we're like sister organizations. We're taking, uh, as best as we can, laboratory approaches. You're a little bit ahead of us in that, in that sense in finding out well, what's happening in the population at large. To summarize what Dr. Radin said, he said, um, in the case of looking at the larger body of a very wide range of experiences, i.e. the contact modalities, he said free, which is now known as CCRI, has taken up the mantle for that part. He said, in some sense, we, which is the Institute for Noetic Sciences, and our new organization, CCRI, are like sister organizations. But he said, you are a little bit ahead of us in finding out what is happening in the population at large. Some of the commonalities of near-death experiences, UAPs, out-of-body experiences, telepathic communication in one's native language, the out-of-body experience, total personality transformation, uh, people see energy beings, human-looking beings, ghost beings, medical healings, reincarnation, visions of the future, visions of the past, total personality transformation, people are taken to a matrix reality, precognition, especially after people return from their experience, paranormal experiences, uh, people later see ghosts and spirits, uh, spiritual messages that are given to them, manipulation of electronic devices, consciousness as non-local, manipulation of space-time and multi-dimensional reality experiences. So these are just some of the many commonalities of the contact modalities. And that's why, as Dr. Alexander stated, he said somehow all of these experiences are interrelated. Quote from David Bowie. Many of you know who he is, one of the most famous musicians in the history of modern times. And he saw a UFO. So this is what he said about the UFO. He said, I believe that what I saw was not the actual object, but a projection of my own mind. 
Didn't I tell you that before? That's what I believe. These are projections. These are consciousness-based phenomena. But a projection of my own mind trying to make sense of this quantum topological doorway into dimensions beyond our own. It's as if our dimension is but one among an infinite number of others. A very wise man. Dr. John Mack. Uh, in 1999, he published a book titled Passport to the Cosmos, Human Transformation and Alien Encounters. Dr. John Mack, for those of you that do not know who he is, he was a tenured professor at the Harvard School of Medicine. And he worked with many individuals that had originally perceived to be abduction experiences, but he later found out that this was way, way more complicated than just abductions. And that's why he published that book. And what he said was, people know their experiences and what they have undergone does not fit with the prevailing mechanistic worldview. Large percentages of people seem to know there is an unseen world or hidden dimensions of reality. Again, another brilliant genius saying the same thing that everyone else has been articulating here in this presentation. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about CCRI, the Consciousness and Contact Research Institute. We are a 501c3, over 25 PhD academics, five medical doctors, and 10 lay researchers. We will be publishing in June 1st of 2022 a four-volume book titled A Greater Reality. So CCRI is a non-for-profit academic research institute focusing on researching what is consciousness, what is the nature of our reality, by undertaking cross-comparative research on individuals that are having various types of contact with non-human intelligence via what we term the contact modalities. CCRI wants to compare the UAP contact experiencer from our free experiencer research study with individuals that have had other types of paranormal contact experiences via the contact modalities. CCRI hypothesis that we are interacting with non-human intelligence via various paranormal phenomena and that all of these contact modalities might be derived from one source and thus might be one phenomenon. We hypothesize that consciousness is what unifies the contact modalities and that consciousness is primary and not our physical reality. CCRI adheres to a post-materialist view of our reality. Now, what is materialism? Materialism is the idea that matter is the only reality and the belief system that the mind is nothing but the activity of our brain. When we die, when our brain no longer ceases to work, that's it. Our consciousness dies. doesn't continue. We say, uh-uh-uh. Consciousness continues. Why? Because consciousness is primary and we are eternal spiritual beings. Ufology, the field of ufology. The majority of CCRI's academics hypothesize that materialist, these are the nuts and bolts approach, of a flying saucer, of a physical picture, or a physical video, or of a UFO crash, that that approach has contributed very little to the understanding of what is the UFO, UFO phenomenon really about. Okay? Here's the question for you. What have we really learned about UFOs over the last 75 years? Well, people see them in the sky. Some, some people are able to take a, a distant video of it, distant picture of it. Okay, we're able to know it's manipulating space-time. And a couple of other things. But other than that, what do we really know about the UFO phenomenon? Okay? Thus, we need a new paradigm, a post-materialist approach to ufology. Research on quantum physics, the psi phenomenon, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, mediumship, hallucinogens, and now the free experience for research study supports the hypothesis that the mind can exist separate from the brain. 
and that consciousness is the key to understand the contact modalities. The majority of researchers of the contact modalities, people that research UFOs, etc., uh, they, uh, they have a materialist perspective that uh, the majority of ufology, for example, consider our work, the CCRI work, woo-woo science. I've heard that on radio shows, people talking about a research study. These very famous names, I won't mention the names. Some of you can guess, oh, that's woo-woo science, okay? But yet, most of these individuals are not even scientists, okay? I would say all of them that have criticized what we're doing. They're not scientists. Yet we've got the scientists in our organization. We've got the, the, the theoretical physicists, the astrophysicists. We've got the neuroscientists. We've got the quantum biologists, et cetera, et cetera. We've got the scientists. But yet what we're doing is woo-woo science. Most ufologists, however, are ignorant of the literature on theoretical physics. They're ignorant about near-death experiences. They're ignorant about out-of-body experiences. They're ignorant of the literature of parapsychology and the data findings of the free experience of research study, okay? Why? Because they never even bothered to read this information. Some of these people don't even bother to listen to my lecture because I'm talking woo-woo science, okay? We're not talking about something that's physical, that's real. We're talking something that's consciousness-based. And that's difficult to get a grasp of, that new paradigm of thought. We live in a spiritual, virtual reality, okay? And that's the belief of many, not all, but I would say the majority of the members of CCRI, okay? Three Nobel Prize winners believe that we are living in a virtual reality. Nobel Prize winners in physics, not just some guy down the street. Dr. Seth Lloyd, a professor of physics at MIT, probably the most well-known person, he wrote a book programming the universe. And he says that the universe is itself is in fact a giant computer. We are living inside a virtual reality. Tom Campbell, a physicist, well known, working for many years with Robert Monroe on out-of-body experiences, he wrote a monstrous book also competing with our book, 800 pages, uh, titled My Big Toe, My Big Theory of Everything. And he basically goes out of body whenever he wants to and does astral traveling. And he conducts physics experiments out of his body. He said, we are living inside a virtual reality. A reality where love is key to source or the universal mind of this virtual reality. And Tom provides an information-based theory of consciousness that explains all of the contact modalities and all of the psi phenomenon and, uh, and our multidimensional reality. So that's his book, My Big Toe. Dr. Jacques Vallée, he wrote the foreword to this book titled The Simulation Hypothesis. So again, this is the father of modern ufology, Dr. Jacques Vallée. And he stated, the simulation hypothesis presents a radical alternative to current models of reality. Many fields rejected or neglected by modern science, such as religious visions, near-death experiences, psychic phenomena, and even UFOs can be brought under this framework. He said the result is a stunning reappraisal of what it means to be human in an infinite universe. Again, the topic of consciousness is primary and not our material reality. Listen to the late and great Dr. Edgar Mitchell. I realize the conundrum here. <clears throat> okay. That our science, uh, based upon a materialist determinist, Newtonian materialist deterministic concept, would say that consciousness, or how we perceive things, is uh, an epiphenomenon, a byproduct of matter, of the accidental organization of matter. Mm. But in the ancient traditions, the oral traditions, they perceive that consciousness is the fundamental stuff and matter descends from consciousness. Erwin Schrodinger, Nobel Prize winner in physics, one of the inventors of quantum physics, stated that consciousness cannot be accounted for in physical terms. For consciousness is absolutely fundamental. It cannot be accounted for in terms of anything else. 
In other words, consciousness is primary and not our physical reality. Raymond Moody, the father of near-death experience research. So this is Raymond Moody talking about consciousness as primary. Consciousness and materialism. And um, I have never been a materialist, I'm sorry. And it's, uh, you know, it's, that's not been my philosophic. I can recite to you all the great materialist philosophers and what their arguments are, but I just don't buy it. To me, it's uh, consciousness has always been primary from the time I was seven or eight. And, uh, you know, I can, you know, I had to pass all my philosophy tests on all the materialist philosophers. I mean, I understand that stuff. It's just that mm -hmm. I don't agree with it. Okay, consciousness is primary by the father of NDE research. Max Planck, also a Nobel Prize winner in physics, one of the inventors of modern quantum physics. He stated, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as a derivative of consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything that we talk about, everything that we regard as existing postulates consciousness. So again, how many Nobel Prize winners we've got so far? Two of them, both inventors of quantum physics, saying consciousness is primary. Dr. Gary Schwartz was a professor at Harvard, professor of Yale, and for the last 20 years, he's been at the University of Arizona. And also, here's a, another quote uh, from Raymond Moody, and this is part of our uh, documentary that we're going to be releasing uh, by the end of the year, titled A Greater Reality. So, Dr. Gary Schwartz. Consciousness is first. If it's primary, if it all starts with a one consciousness and everything else is then part of that one and evolves from that one, and we all have this, we're all part of the unified whole. We're all both one, we're all the one, and we're also a unique part of the one. I think the primary reality is consciousness and that physicality is projected by the consciousness to give continuity to the narrative aspect of life. That's what I think. So Raymond Moody has a PhD in philosophy, and he's a medical doctor. He's a psychiatrist, saying that consciousness is primary. Eugene Wigner. Now we've got the third Nobel Prize winner in physics. What did Dr. Eugene Wigner state? It will remain remarkable in whatever way our future concepts may develop, that the very study of the external world led to the scientific conclusion that the content of the consciousness is the ultimate universal reality. In other words, consciousness is primary. Dr. Eben Alexander, a professor of brain surgery at the Harvard Medical School, had a near-death experience that totally changed his concept of reality, just like me. We both got hit in the head by a two-by-four. Dr. Eben Alexander. In our previous discussion about uh, integrating the near-death experience, you, you described your journey as a materialistic scientist. And, and what that means is that uh, Matter, inert, dead matter, is the fundamental bedrock of uh, everything we experience in the universe. But there's another point of view. It's actually a very ancient point of view uh, with a, a noble philosophical tradition, which is the opposite, that consciousness is primary, not matter. The hard problem of consciousness, which is the extreme challenge in the neuroscience of consciousness and philosophy of mind in trying to come up with any mechanism mm -hmm. by which the physical brain might give rise to consciousness uh, is a very daunting issue. And in fact, most of the people I know involved in the scientific study of consciousness uh, are now moving to much more expanded models. And mm -hmm. it's because they realize uh, that the simplistic notion of the physical world being all that exists and the brain is somehow creating consciousness out of purely physical matter is completely false. It does not explain even the rudiments of conscious awareness in our consensus day-to-day uh, -day reality. So 
the whole world of psychology and examination of mind and consciousness is revealing all kinds of ways that we can be aware of things beyond the kin of our physical senses. Mm -hmm. Things like remote viewing, yep. you know, the psychic spy programs uh, in many government agencies over the last many decades, uh, showing that there are ways that uh, people can train to actually uh, know things beyond the kin of their mm -hmm. physical senses. Out-of-body experiences mm -hmm. are something uh, that... Many people have uh, kind of come to discover on their own and have taken advantage of. Um, and so these are all ways of saying that consciousness is not limited to the confines of the physical brain and the body. And, of course, the big implication of all that is what happens when the brain and body die. Uh, and there it looks very strongly like the reality is <clears throat> not only that our consciousness continues beyond death of the brain and body, but that it actually expands tremendously in its kind of scope and understanding. Dr. Eben Alexander, the universal mind, we live in a virtual and spiritual reality. So let's hit on the spiritual aspects of it. A spiritual virtual reality. Finally, thousands of peer-reviewed academic research studies on near-death experiences have demonstrated that we are inside a greater reality, inside the mind of God, that is deeply loving and spiritual reality, and that we as humans are eternal spiritual beings. Dr. Edgar Mitchell. We're narrowing in on how to model this within science. Where we can, what we can address at this point in time uh, because of the quantum hologram and the way nature interacts with itself through the quantum hologram can come to a conclusion that we live in a universe that is intelligent, self-organizing, creating, learning, trial and error, participatory, interactive, non-locally interconnected evolutionary system. He's talking about the mind of God. Dr. Raymond Moody. One of the primary insights that characterizes mystical experiences generally is the idea that everything is one. All is one. That's kind of the slogan of all the great mystics. And this unifying aspect uh, occurs in the near-death experience too. People say that what we experience in life is differences really that at a higher state of reality um, Things that seem different here are really the same. And that includes even personal identity. People will say that in their life review, they become the people with whom they interacted. Because when you see an action that you di did, you see it in your life review. You watch it from the point of view of the person with whom you interacted, and you are empathically embedded in, your, in their consciousness. So really what that means, I suppose, is that because of the interconnections, we are really all this one of the same being. We're different, I guess, different fac facets or aspects of one underlying unitary consciousness. To me, God is not belief or curiosity about whether God exists. I mean, to me, I, I compute God as a relationship. Right. So, to me, um, the relationship with, that you have with God, it then, therefore, it sort of it boils down to a relationship with all the other conscious presences in the universe, I think. Dr. Raymond Moody, on the one mind of God, that we're all interrelated. Sir John Eccles, Nobel Prize winner in physiology and medicine stated, I maintain that the human mystery is incredibly demeaned by scientific reductionism, materialism, with its claim to account for all of the spiritual world in terms of patterns of neural activity. This belief must be classed as a superstition. We have to recognize that we are spiritual beings with souls existing in a spiritual world as well as material beings with bodies and brains existing in a material world. So again, this is not just some guy down the street. This is a Nobel Prize winner in physiology and medicine. Finally, Dr. Jeffrey Long, one of the co-editors of our new book, A Greater Reality. Greater is one of, uh, Jeffrey's one of the leading academic researchers 
on near-death experiences? It was so obvious to me and so many other, pretty much all near-death experience researchers, that near-death experiences are for real. So given that premise, you really have to have that premise established, which between my research and many others, clearly establishes before you can go the next step, and that is, okay, if you totally understand, based on evidence that near-death experiences are real, what else can you understand? What's important in them to learn? And for me, it was very obvious. That is the big picture, God, the afterlife, sort of why we're here on earth, if you will, the big question. So I was able to do that, Ray, because I'm in private practice and I'm not as constrained as other of my research colleagues are in academic environments and subject of criticism and potentially impairment in their career based on criticism of the research. I had I was wide open. I could publish whatever I went, wanted to do as long as it was, a, it was the truth based on the professional situation I'm in. So I, I literally, Ray, had the freedom to explore this in a way that other people knew but were reluctant to share about. And of course, another big thing is I have the evidence. I asked the survey questions. I really had that interest in that and explored that with the best scientific survey questions possible to really understand that and nail that down. So as you say, God and the afterlife, the, the first word I use, of course, God. Absolutely, Ray, just as you implied right there, as others have found, there's that unity, oneness of all. God, the, the one, the everything. Near-death experiencers, Ray, have a hard time with the word God. They so often say that's a human word to describe something that is beyond human language and beyond human understanding. That is the one, the overwhelming. And the great news, Ray, for my research, God is profoundly loving, cares for us, uh, wants the best for each and every one of us in our earthly lives. So it was a fantastic experience to do the research that, that led to that book, to share that with the world. And it's one of the most remarkable, positive, uh, creative uh, representations of God that I'm aware of. So that's exciting to bring that to the world. Okay. Um, my introductory chapter to the four-volume book, A Greater Reality, is titled Towards a Unified Theory of Consciousness and the Contact Modalities. And I will expand on the, uh, in my chapter on what I talked about uh, today. Our new book, this is what it looks like, A Greater Reality, The New Paradigm of Non-Local Consciousness, The Paranormal, and the Contact Modalities. And as you can see, very boldly illustrated are near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, UFO, and spirits, and also numerous other paranormal experiences. And again, I'll send you like six chapters from this book for free. Just send me an email. Uh, volumes 1 and 2 will be published on June 1st. Those are our theoretical chapters. Volumes 3 and 4 are our experiencer chapters. And I believe there's several individuals. I know one is Lynn. That's here that wrote a chapter for our book. Um, and she wrote about her out-of-body experiences. And um, so each book is expected to be approximately six to 700 pages. And I'm going to put them all in one volume in Kindle and sell them like for 20 bucks, you know. So you can get 2,500 pages to read for the rest of your life <laughs> for 20 bucks. <laughs> all right. Um, as I said before, we've got all these academics, all these medical doctors and lay researchers in our organization. And my buddy, Dr. John Alexander, who's going to be speaking tomorrow, is a member of this group. I wanted to go to my website, okay? Um, it's titled agreaterreality.com, agreaterreality.com, but I don't have enough time to go through it. Instead, what I'm going to show you is the trailer for our documentary. We've been working on this documentary for five years. We've interviewed over 40 uh, academics and medical doctors and over 80 experiencers, okay? Similar to what, what our books are all about. And so this is the trailer for um, our documentary. It's titled A Greater Reality, One Man's Discovery, One Man's Journey of Discovery. That'll be released by the end of the year. Well, I would say my near-death experience in many ways changed me completely. 
The first time I had an experience with the beings, I was about five years old. I'm able to travel outside of my body on the astral plane, and I have done since I was nine years old. It's like your vision is not from the eyes, it's from something else. My name is Ray Hernandez. I'm an IRS tax attorney. I had zero interest in anything that was paranormal related. And then my life was turned upside down. Holy shit, what the hell just happened? <laughs> Would have an out of body experience three or four times a month, and I'd learn how to move, fly, walk through walls. The elements of a near death experience are first, separation of consciousness and out of body experience. I detached from my lifeless body. There were beings. Spiritual beings swirling around me and bringing me peace. A being of complete compassion and love and knowledge. I was shown things that you just don't see in this world. When I opened my eyes, there was Katie, this little girl spirit. I wanted to know where she was buried. I'm going to the cemetery and she's guiding me. Right here is her little place. And their eyes were these glowing, green, blue, iridescent, beautiful eyes, but kind of spooky because they were so bright. It was like looking at a hologram. So what I discovered is as people become more aware of their experiences, that their perspective in life is changed. I think one is always changed. I think that's what our ancestors were trying to tell. And so I started looking at the Bible in a different way. Everybody got on their camels, and converged on Bethlehem to see what's up with that star up there. Consciousness is at the heart of all of this. It is that glue that binds all of these experiences together. Our consciousness includes the physical universe. It includes the cosmos. Everything we know about quantum physics and cosmology. We are saturated with, with intelligent life right here and right now. And it's only by bringing all these pieces together, both finding their commonalities and how they can each inform each other, that we can then see the big picture. Is there life after death? Do we live in a simulated reality? Is it possible that all of these paranormal experiences are somehow interrelated? Humanity needs to change. We need to become much more spiritual. We need to become much more ecological. We need to become much more loving and caring. And that's why it's taking place right now. It changed my life in a way that I no longer have a fear about death. And that's what I think we're here to do, is to bring an aspect of God into physical existence. From my perspective, uh, quantum physics doesn't only allow for the spiritual realm, that is for the afterlife and for reincarnation, for all these things to be real, it insists on it. This is going to change everything. Okay, this was a, a documentary team that produced 12 documentaries for William Shatner, including one of Leonard Nimoy, titled In Search of Spock. So, as I said before, if you want to receive um, six chapters from each of my two books for free, this is my email, info at agreatoreality.com. I've got business cards in case you don't want to write this down. Send me an email and I'll give you all this free literature. And again, thank you very much.